Immigration officials are getting ready for a possible new wave of people seeking asylum here in Canada. Temporary protections for hundreds of thousands of Salvadorans in the U.S. are about to expire. And with the White House signaling those might not be renewed, there is concern that will mean more people arriving at the Canadian border. Joining us to take a closer look is immigration lawyer Mario Bellissimo and Manuel Rodriguez. They, he came to Canada as a refugee from El Salvador during its civil war. Great to have both of your perspectives here this morning. Good morning. All right, Mario, let's start with you. Tell us about these temporary uh, protections and why there is fear that those might be lifted in the U.S. So the temporary protection status was extended to El Salvador in the United States in 2001. And it's for environmental disasters, civil war, other temporary conditions. But it expires in March of 2018, and the White House has signaled that potentially they will not be renewing the, that status. And that could affect how many people? We said hundreds of thousands. Do so you have a closer number? About 200,000 El Salvadorians. Oh, yes. It's a large population. Yes. yes. Uh, Manuel, you came to Canada yourself. You arrived in 1989 during the Civil War. Take us back to that time. What led you here to Canada? Well, a month uh, before I came to Canada, the civil war, a 10-year civil war started in the capital city of San Salvador, where I, where I was studying computer science at the Jesuit University. The Jesuits were considered a left-wing uh, uh, people. They were priests uh, that were educating. And, uh, and at the time, uh, the army killed my, the dean of my university, my sociology teacher, and my ethics teacher. And, you know, like when, when that happened, the professors were killed. We knew that uh, our life was in danger. So the Canadian um, Development Agency uh, called us and they told us if we wanted to leave, we could leave as a family. And uh, we were like three sisters, my brother, my mother, and my father. Yeah. And uh, they gave us the choice of leaving within five days. And, wow. and uh, something that I didn't expect, uh, all of a sudden we were with one luggage each and we came uh, to the Pearson Airport. Less, less than a week's notice. Yes. Amazing. Uh, Mario, we know parts of the Canadian border. We've been covering these stories for you know, at least six months now. They've started to become overwhelmed. There's not enough places to put everybody that's you know, crossing the border by land. It's a struggle to get all the paperwork processed in time because it's just it's more numbers than they're used to handling. Uh, what kind of impact would a possible new wave of immigration at the border cause? Well, if you look at the, the Refugee Protection Division at this point, they have about 26,000 cases pending. So if you're 26,000 pending. Pending. So even if you discuss a, a, a portion of Salvadorians crossing the border of that 200,000, and there's other, uh, Honduras, we've heard about uh, Haiti. Um, so if you get a portion of that, it could reach unsustainable levels. I mean, we have had large influxes in the past, uh, Indo-Chinese, the Hungarians, the Czech, Vietnamese in the pa past. So we have dealt with huge numbers, but this would reach you know, game-changing numbers. Uh, Manuel, this is a very different situation than the one that you were facing back in 1989, but what would your advice be to, to the Salvadoran people who may be affected in the U.S. who are fearful that, you know, their protections may be lifted? Of course, I want them to be here in Canada, but uh, the reality is uh, the system may not be able to allow them to come. I think this is a great opportunity, though, for Canada to get these uh, economic uh, workers that exist in the U.S., if there is over 200,000, 90% of them are employed. They have their own real estate. Kids may be going to high school, and they are already immersed in the, in the American society. So why not uh, save some money and try to bring some of them through the right process? But to bring them to the right process, there has to be the right communication to these people that they cannot come to the border, that they had to apply through the process. And that's, that's what I want to ask you about is the messaging. We saw some of this earlier in the year with, with various different communities about how the message is being spread and the perhaps misunderstanding that all you had to do was cross the border by land and you would be you know, granted safety right away. What kind of messaging should get out there? I think there are consular bodies from El Sabo that can spread this message. And the Canadian government should be talking to the Salvadorian government in the United States so they can uh, be able to distribute this information and educate and do a marketing campaign. I think it's going to be worth it uh, to do something like that and not to be able to find a humanitarian crisis at our borders. Is it miscommunication or fear, Mario, or a little bit of both that caused people to seek asylum over the border as opposed to applying legally like Manuel suggests? I think you're right. I think it's a bit of both. Um, there was some social media campaigns that spread information that it was almost an automatic once you cross the border, which is just not the case. Mm -hmm. Some of these individuals will be processed to removal, not to settle in Canada. And in other cases, there's fear. I mean, as, as Manuel mentioned, these people are immersed. It's, it's a bit nuanced. They're very established in American society. They have to meet eligibility requirements. They're good civil participants in society. 
and to suddenly be forced to potentially leave somewhere. You know, we're talking about people that have been there since 2001. Mm -hmm. Their whole lives have uh, been set up Their whole lives, there. right. So th this is very nuanced. It's different, um, and there would be a lot of fear driving a potential return to a country that their children may not know. Uh, they've been removed for over a decade. What is the situation in El Salvador? What would they be facing if they left the U.S. and went back to El Salvador? Uh, completely different from the civil war now. Now there is a big security problem with gangs. Guns that uh, you know were moved back from the prisons from the United States back to El Salvador, and they they were kids that uh, were violent, and they were received during the civil war. Mm. Now they are living in El Salvador, and they are living in gangs, and they are threatening uh, the society, and that's why many of them, uh, professionals, had to leave El Salvador because they were threatened. And uh, now the United States is saying that he's going to send them back, and I think that's a big issue. They cannot go back to uh, an insecure society where they left because of those threats. And for a lot of these people, they have families. North America is the only, and the U.S. is the only home they know. So to say you're sending them home isn't really a fair characterization. That's right. Many of them, uh, kids are going to university and they never live in there. They came probably when they were two months old. And I think going back, sending them back, it'll be like a humanitarian case. But in this case, if that's not the case for Canada to accept them as a humanitarian case, I think it should be also considered as an economic, a different case. This is something that we haven't seen before. Mario, I'll give the last word to you. What do you think should be the Canadian government response? And we're sort of, uh, you know, highlighting the fact that, look, this is coming. What do we need to do on Canada's side to respond? I think it has to be a multi-tiered response. I think governments have to speak. I think we, we've heard about sites being set up at Olympic Stadium. We've heard about remote immigration teams processing on site. Um, we have to look to move members around um, in terms of uh, faster processing. The key is to facilitate entry as quickly as possible for those that are deserving and not create a crisis of delay. I want to thank you both for being here today. Good to hear both of your perspectives on thank this you. story. Thank you, Marie.